All right. Good afternoon, or actually good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we're delighted to have uh, with us this evening Richard Evans, Richard Paul Evans, um, going to be discussing his brand new book, a Christ Christmas Memory. And as always, Richard has very kindly signed a whole batch of them for us. And uh, there we go. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and put a, I'll put a, a buy link in the notes field, or I'm sorry, in the comments field on YouTube and Facebook. So if you'd like to purchase one, you can do so. And also, if you have questions for Richard, um, as they occur to you throughout the, the next hour or so, just type them in and Barbara will bring me back on screen and I'd be happy to ask any questions you might have. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you. Our very own bookstore elf will perform. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to get you a hat for the rest of December, you know, an elf hat or something. I think that'll be great. Anyway, I want to point out that this beautiful book, look at this gorgeous artwork. It's a lovely little size and it's an astonishing little price of only $17.99 and autograph. It's an absolutely amazing Christmas gift. Right, Richard? And I'm sure that you had a lot to do with that. I did. They, they told me they were going to raise the price of my book again. And um, I said, I would like to lower the price. And they just said, no, the price of paper's gone up and inflation. I said, no, you're going to want to do it with this one. It's a, it's a special book. People want to share it. And um, I prevailed. They, they lowered the price. I'm very, very impressed. And I will tell you that we had a recent discussion with another publisher who announced the day before Thanksgiving that they were going to raise the prices of their hardcover books $4. And I said, you know, that's crossing the $30 line is just not, is not going to work. So we had a kind of emergency staff meeting and we decided we're going to hold the line at $29.95. So we're basically going to take the hit for any author who is doing an event or coming to visit us. Because I, I just don't think that people are going to respond you know, to that kind of a price hike, even though I sympathize with publishers and their increasing, increasing costs, you think they have to be more sensitive to, to readers. So good for you. That's great. That well, well, you know, I was raised poor as you, you know, you read in the book, it explains some of that. And I remember being afraid to ask my mom for the, for the dollar 50 so I could do the book fair and get two books. <laughs> We've come a long way since then, but I remember just the books, I couldn't afford them. And and my first book was The Christmas Box. And I started with the price of a, it was a card, it was $4.95 for a paperback book. And it sold 8 million copies. I mean, it, it, it worked. And no, you know, it well with it. So I, there's something to be said for when you have something that people are going to share. I, I think there are books that obviously no one's going to go out and buy 10 copies anyway. But so this is a little um, different. Um, there's a lot we're going to talk about, and I'd like to start by saying in the acknowledgments to this book, Richard says, this book was difficult for my wife, Carrie, to read, since she alone knows how much of it is true. And I think, um, in a sense, this is autobiographical, but in a sense, it's also a novel. And I don't know whether Richard wants to distinguish how much of it is true from how much isn't, but it's a really moving story. And I was fascinated, Richard, because, you know, I'm older than you are. And I remember when a nickel actually bought something or, you know, I mean, I used to get a quarter a week allowance when I was a little kid and I could go up and buy several things at Woolworths for 25 cents. Um, and, you know, I think people reading the prices that you talk about in the book, well, it would be really hard for them to relate to that today. One of the fun things about this book I've been hearing from people is that it is taking them back into their childhoods and their memory. That's how it was. You know, and, and someone said, did you really sell bottles? I said, absolutely. I just, it was like gold mining for me. I just walk up and down looking for bottles to take to the depot. And to me, it was like, it was this great chocolate alchemy. I could take a bottle and turn it into a Reese's peanut butter cup. Absolutely. I still want to know, what did the guy do with the bottles that he bought? Oh, well, it, it was during the, um, I mean, they would recycle them, right? So back then, all the bottles would do that. They would actually tend to send them back and wash them and use them again. Right. So, I mean, basically, he was then returning them to the, the supplier or the manufacturer or whatever. You start, you brought them into your little wagon to him, and then he mm -hmm. passed them on, presumably in a truck or something, to somebody else. Yeah. Um, the, it's a neat system. doesn't work with plastic back in the day. Actually, you used to put a deposit down, right? 
Yeah, I'm they still do it. For doing that. In California, there's, in Oregon, there's deposit some books. Or excuse so, me, not in bottles, yeah. So did you actually, were you actually a very young child in California? Yes. And so in part, this, this is the story of how Richard and his family uh, left California and ended up in Utah where Richard is. Have you lived there the entire time ever since? Have you ever left Utah? Um, well, we lived in Florence, Italy, and I lived in Taiwan for two years. So, um, but it, since when I came back, this has been my home base since I came back. And that was at the age of- I've only known you when you lived in Utah, but you know, I, I yeah, found I it. You would have had an entirely different life if you'd stayed in California. That's for sure. Yeah. Wow, it's fascinating to me. I remember visiting Salt Lake City years ago, and now I see how it's changed. I find it interesting that the Mormon church has actually come out in favor of same-sex marriage. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> support, sorry. You know, I don't mean that they're pushing it, but they did actually come out to make a statement that they would support that, which I thought um, really really was interesting because I, I think of it as such a conservative place. I remember playing in a bridge tournament in Salt Lake City and I'm not a drinker, but other people were and everybody was trying to work out how to accomplish all that. So um, I think I think Utah obviously has changed dramatically. Has Park City had a lot to do with that? Do you think the ski crowd and the tourist crowd? Mm, no, no, I think it's a much more complex issue. Has nothing to do with my book, but it's a. It's no, a I know. A, I was just sort of. It's a much more complex issue than that. I think the idea of trying to protect um, marriage, that the whole institution of marriage is in danger, I believe. I think, I think it's like they made a decision based on trying to codify some, some important parts of keeping marriage, you know, a working structure, institution. Well, marriage is actually a, a key part of your book, your parents' marriage, or at least the Richard it, yeah. the marriage of Richard's parents is at risk. Um, so why don't you tell us um, what what happened? Because it did change your family so tremendously and caused well, you to move. Well, people always want to know what's the most important, um, you know, what part of the books are true. And uh, this, uh, this book is true. And they assume that... Um, that most of it is true. I mean, my my brother Mark was surprised to hear that he was dead. <laughs> so that's- um, well, I'm relieved to hear that because Mark seemed like such a wonderful person. Mark is a wonderful guy. Mark is the one who told me to be a writer. He was he was a, a scholar and he speaks seven languages. And and uh, he's the one who said, you're a better writer than you know. And uh, he, he read um, a lot and he did get me to read. He's, he got me started on Shakespeare and O'Henry and, Oh, Henry was a great start for me because to learn how to turn a story quickly and keep it interesting. Oh, Henry was a genius at it. And so I look back and it was, it was a big part of it. Um, outside of that, the horrible things, the most difficult things in the book are all true. You know, what happened to my mother, it's true. Uh, Mr. Foster is a real person. Uh, the uh, Mrs. Covey, unfortunately, is a real person. Uh, she, if she was alive, she'd be getting a lot of hate mail. She's not alive. She died, you know, decades ago. And, you know, think I, I would have changed her name otherwise because um, people don't like her much after reading the book. People track her down. I've had two people come to me who knew her um, and they said, boy, you were dead on. She wow. was the nastiest person I've ever met. And, and a teacher um, wherewithal. Like some people just are really unhappy. And, but she was on borderline. I, I don't I don't pull back much on that. And someone said, Wow, imagine if someone really was that mean. She was really that mean. That everything she did is almost verbatim um, from what I you know, remember, but it was scarring. And she was just short of abusive. And uh, so to be in that really difficult time when my parents were really separated, my mother struggling with mental illness and um, severe depression. And I was a lone kid, you know, I was. You know, I'd hang out in the field all day. If I one day I just didn't go to school, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to get bullied. There, it was a mean school. It was a mean place. I got beaten up a lot, and um, I just my mother painted this when we left. She said, "This is such a beautiful place, and everyone's kind." And she had this idyllic memory of what, when she lived there, what it was like, with her twelve siblings, and um, 
it was nothing like that. It was now the, the farm farmland was was changed into bars and pawn shops. And um, it was it was rough. Well, you do point out that, um, you know, that was the power of the memory that made your mother want to take you to Utah, which she thought would be as safe and as your parents were separating. And well, as Richard's, maybe, shall I call him Richard? Because I don't want to call him you the whole time. Oh, Ricky, yeah. Not all of us, right. Well, anyway. We should call him Ricky, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I can understand that, that she, you know, would want to tap back into happy memories of her childhood and what she thought was going to be the support of five of her sisters and, um, and their husbands and didn't necessarily turn out, but where, where was your brother, Mark? Was he enough? Cause he's a lot older than you, right? You point that out. Where was he when your family went back to Utah? He was with us. So, so but you were still that coming along. That's why it's important to not take all of it true. It's a novel. Not it's a, a novel, um, but it was drawn heavily from my own life. It's the most, I mean, I draw from all of my books uh, right now on uh, Netflix. Um, I think it was the number one movie in America last week on Netflix is the Noel diary. And with starring Justin Hartley, it's, it's a huge movie. Um, my first feature film that was drawn on my real life. I, I really was, there was a teenage, a pregnant teenage girl who took care of me um, when I was a baby. And um, the, the most peculiar part of that is that she actually showed up. She, um, or the baby actually showed up the grown woman to one of my book signings. And it was, um, Psychologically, it was a little rough because I, you know, to take this book and spell it out and then to have her actually show up in my life, it was pretty rough. Well, how did Mark fare since he didn't die in Vietnam as the Mark in the book? He's in the military. Oh, he was in the military. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he's, um, he, Mark has done well. He's, like I said, he's a linguist. He's very smart. And um, you know, he's as close as my brother. So he's a good kid. Well, in the book, um, Mark, who is older than Richard, um, does end up going off to Vietnam to fight, and it causes a major schism with his parents when he when he dies and doesn't come home. Um, is supposed to come home, in fact, for Christmas, right? But unfortunately, they get news that he is not. Um, and the father in this book is. Um, is just shattered because he encouraged him to go. You know, it, I thought about back to that war. I'm a Vietnam War widow. You probably don't know that, but my first husband actually went to Vietnam and died there. And I was fairly young. Um, and it's hard to explain why people, why people were so divided about it then and how many people chose to go, even though there wasn't much in the way of popular support for a war that had actually no good game plan or no good ending. You know, what were we going to do with it? If, I mean, I feel like that to a great degree is true of the war of Afghanistan. You know, what were we going to do with the country should we happen to win? But I think a lot of it was the Cold War and the fear of communism and that, you know, somehow we had to had to create this bulwark or, or prevent it from spreading. And I, I thought the way you, you portray your father uh, or the father in the book is wanting Mark to go and say he'd be ashamed of him if he didn't was, in fact, an attitude that a lot of people had. Well, the, the, world's, the world has changed a lot. Uh, there is um, the way we saw politics and people. First of all, um, we don't cut them any slack. In fact, now with social media, that, that every little action they make. I mean, I'm watching CNN and they're talking about how many, how many scoops of ice cream um, Donald, President Trump had on his cone. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, this is news. And, you know, J John F. Kennedy was, was, um, an inc was a remarkable, tireless uh, womanizer. And um, it's estimated two to three women a day were being brought in. The Secret Service's number one job was bringing them in. We didn't look at that. We didn't talk about it. And the thing is, John, John Kennedy was a tremendous president and may have saved our country. You know, from the Cold War, the way he handled it, the strength he handled it with, he may have saved millions of lives. And um, we looked at things, we looked at politics, we had this sense of, um, of trust. And that veneer came off and it really got stripped off during Wa uh, Watergate. And now no one trusts the government at all. There's a time that we actually looked up to it. 
And so you can you can get that sense that there was a huge change that America was changing at the time. And it's never gone, it's never gone back to that. I remember and, 1969, which was a remarkable year with so many, so much in the way of right, you know, we think of January 6th and how terrible that was, but I remember 1969 and the riots, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and all the, you know, it felt like the whole country was going to come apart. Right. And, and that's one of the things I was writing this, I was pointing out that um, it feels very much like today. In fact, in some ways, it was it was even it was even harder. Uh, the big difference, again, is social media. Basically, we put a bullhorn in everyone's hands so everyone can shout at whatever they want. And so uh, and especially hate on both sides. And um, it's just kind of we also see for the first time the real limit of freedom of speech. And so the world has changed. It's changed dramatically and not for the better. Uh, the American culture is, I, I believe, is in severe danger. Um, for the first time in my career, I'm seeing books banned. I'm seeing books um, that are people who would have been fighting for their rights to print. You know, the, the, in my last book I wrote, you know, I used, they used to believe that, um, you know, I may not like what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. That's gone. Now it's like, if you say something I don't like, I want to kill you. Well, we're all siloed. Part of the problem with social media is the anonymity. Part of the fact is it's yeah. free. Part it's of the exactly. is it's instant. So nobody really has to sit down and think about, you know, what they're going to say uh, for sure. And we are very siloed. For sure. um, I, I must admit that I was very pessimistic about the election and I feel somewhat better that. Um, but anyway. That not yeah, I, all the people with with destructive agendas managed to um, manage to sell it. So I was happy about that. We'll see how it goes. Um, well, yeah, you know, this. I mean, I remember twenty years ago saying, you know, the, the internet is the bathroom stall of media. And when you're talking about the isolation, is right. People say things that you never say to in someone's face. Right. No, yeah. it, it's definitely the fact that it's yeah, so all of a sudden you have all these cowards that are just you know popping up. And, well, we but, have a rule. I have a rule at the store, which basically says you know don't engage. Um, and what's really remarkable is the most difficult emails that we generally get are from people who aren't even customers or define <laughs> themselves as customer, and then when you look, they have never bought anything. I mean, you know, in a retail operation, a customer is a person who actually spends money, who buys something from you. Just showing up um, is not does not really make you a customer. But well, we're digressing. This is basically <laughs> in the end. There's this. This is a despite all the difficult things that happen, it is a Christmas book, and it's it's a very moving conclusion. I must admit that I cried a little, and part of it I have to tell you is that I the dog. We haven't talked about Bo yet, but the dog is a wonderful character, and you have to be happy that Mr. Foster had a plan for Bo. Was Bo a real, a real dog? Bo, well, Bo is a real dog. I, Bo is my dog right now. Uh, right. I would, I would have to bring him down because I absolutely adore this dog. He brought so much love into our lives. Um, the real dog at the time had a horrible name, which just didn't work for the book. It was almost as bad as Gollum. Um, my, my brother gave and his girlfriend gave it to me when I first moved to Utah during this hard time. His name was Gertie Grouch. <laughs> a right. horrible name um oh. it was gertie was my only friend wow. and so um all that about you know the, the friendship and how important it was is true so so um yeah that part gets me there's a lot of parts the robot the building robots um that was me i, I read a book and i don't know if you've ever seen it in your store but it's called andy buckram's tin men mm -hmm. um, that was my favorite book of all time. I hunted it down. I bought a vintage copy of it. It's been, long, been out of print for 50 years. And um, it's about a boy who builds robots and they, they're they struck by lightning, kind of like Frankenstein. They come to life. When I was that age, I started building a robot. I, was I, just so I thought if I build a robot, then he would be my friend and just follow me around. And, um, and I look back and there's kind of a pathos to it. It's, it's, it, it, it was very lonely. You know, and to have a Mr. Foster in my life. And that's the other thing. Um, one of the first men who read it was my assistant, Diane. It was her husband. And um, he, he 
took out stairs and read it. And like when he came down, she he had like tears in his eyes and couldn't speak. And she goes, Are you okay? Did something happen? She thought something happened to their kids. And but and then she goes, It's the book. <laughs> and it, it really impacted them. And and then later he said, you know, it was nice to have a really positive male role model, um, which aren't often portrayed in media. And um, Mr. Foster was a good man. You would never let a little boy just walk over to an old man's house these days. But I did. And this is funny. So when people bring things to my book signing, they brought this Brock's Chocolate Stars. Oh, and he, uh, he must have had bags and bags of this because he always had Brock Chocolate Stars. And every time I'd go over, he'd go get me, get me one or two. And which to me was just like the best thing in the world because we never had candy. And uh, so um, you know, I think that's part of the fun of the book, right? Just the idea of going back in time and you know, Shakey's Pizza. And this is funny. Um, someone brought to a signing Bean with Bacon Soup. I remember it. I used to uh, eat a lot of bean and bacon soup. Uh, everyone did. And I, I posted, I said, I love this stuff and I still eat it. And I love bean with bacon soup. And I got 7,000 responses to it. And someone wrote, really, on a post about Be With Bacon Soup? It's like, you know, when you open up people's memories to things that were part of their childhood. And oh, so, and so that's what I think this book does. And I think it's one of the reasons people are responding so powerfully to it. it you know, Campbell's Soup, not just being in bacon, but Campbell's Soup was a major part of the American culinary landscape. Cream, if you had cream and mushroom soup in your pantry, you could prepare all kinds of, if you, had, if you had pasta and cream and mushroom soup and tuna fish, you were ready to have a surprise drop in company. And I don't know that we, we really, today, people would recognize just how major a foodstuff um, that Campbell's Soup Company was and how it shaped lives. Oh, look at, look at Andy Warhol. Andy, you know, right. when he did the, the, you know, the tomato soup can, it's, for tens of millions of dollars. It's like, it's, he knew what he was doing. Well, one of the things deep in, the in book, our culture and hearts. Yeah, one of the things in the book that really comes across is how hungry young Richard is. They don't have much money. His mother's too depressed to come out of her room and, um, and he has to make do. He eats a lot of bean and bacon soup. But, a lot of fruit and walnuts. Yep, peaches, canned peaches. You know, my mother in the war, we had a victory garden. And my mother made the most amazing pickled peaches. And she was so tired of it when the war was over, she threw away the recipe and just nearly broke my heart. And talk about wanting to go back. I would give anything if I could find her pickled peaches recipe because they were so extraordinary. So, you know, don't you think that smell and taste are so evocative? You, you have them throughout the book because Mr. Foster not only gives him chocolate, but actually bakes, he makes cookies. Uh, he bakes bread, he even makes croissant on one occasion. There's a lot of food in this book. Um, but don't you think that that touches people's memories, both smell and taste? Yeah, it's the books are about, uh, it, they should be a buffet of sensory experiences. And food is always a part of my books. Um, and someone asked, why, do you, why is food such a part? I said, because first of all, if you wanted, if you wanted to find a character, you know, if, if, you, if you had a, you know, pate foie gras for breakfast, or like several Cuba trips, like kippers for breakfast, or you had Cheerios with sugar on top. You know, it's like, it tells you so much about the individual. So it's a great way to build a character. The other part is you bring them in. So my first book that I wrote, The Christmas Box, when they sat down and have dinner together, it's like, you know, you kind of felt like you're having dinner with them. It was a pleasant experience and dinner can be very pleasant. In this case, this little boy, you know, he goes to his house and he has a treat every time he goes there because Mr. Foster likes to bake. And it, it just makes for, in, in kind of this tempest he lives in, it's kind of this wonderful little island that he can, that Ricky can hide in and feel joy. Because when he walks into Mr. Foster's house, it feels like Christmas. And in fact, one of, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes is when Mr. Foster comes out wearing a Santa Claus, and I won't spoil it, but to me, that was one of the most powerful scenes and chapters in the entire book. Um, as right Mr. Mrs. Covey told everyone that there's no sense and those parents are liars, which completely happened. Completely. Wow. I mean, that part, that part is, it drives people crazy. But I mean, to hold us after class so she can tell us that there is no Santa Claus. And, you know, we left like we just heard the death of a friend. And to make it worse, she told us that her parents are liars. 
And so to go home and to say, I mean, today, I think they would have, someone would have gone after her and they probably should have. Um, but, you know, I, I walked home just brokenhearted and I, I, it's like, okay, mom, tell me, you know, I walked into the dark bedroom where she's been in bed all day and said, Mrs. Covey said that you're a liar. She said, there's no Santa Claus and that you're lying. And you know, my mother said, well, Santa Claus is a spirit of giving. And I said, but he has a sleigh and reindeer too, right? And she goes, no, Rick, there is no Santa. And more as disturbing, just as disturbing as finding that there is no Santa Claus that way, was that Mrs. Covey, this nasty woman, was right. It's like, it, that was one of those cr cracks in, oh. in the veneer that, that evil sometimes wins. And sometimes maybe evil has its basis. And, and my response, I, I think back, and I thought it was pretty profound for a nine-year-old boy. I just sat there in the darkness for a moment and I said, mom, did you lie about Jesus too? And I mean, that's exactly how it happened. I mean, you, once you start unraveling the, the, you know, this, this belief system, where does it go? Why was your mom so depressed? Do you, do you have any, I mean, again, this is a Christmas book, so mom gets better, but, or at least shakes off some of it, but why was she so depressed? Um, I think a lot of women were depressed back at that time. You know, and Mick Jagger sings about Mama's Little Helper, you know, about Valium when they're handing out Valium like candy. Uh, my mother had 11 children. Oh, no, excuse me. She had, um, she gave birth to nine children. There were 11 of them, um, one, one of whom died. And um, it met, wreaked havoc with her hormones and her system. And it was until she was older. You know, she was very suicidal. Just like in the book, uh, what I write about in there happened. I remember, I'll never forget that night. And um, it was, it wasn't until she was older that she got help. And um, I think that's, I think that's a reality. But a lot of people say, well, why was you depressed? You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And it's not that simple. It's not that way. I mean, mental illness is a disease like cancer. And um you know, people struggle and my mother really struggled. And, and it's, and then in the cultural situation she went, what she was in, it just compounded it. How does your father cope with that? Not well, they, they, I, they didn't, my father was an interesting bird himself. In some ways I was much closer to my mother than my father. Um, he did just kind of check out of my life. And um, it, one time he told me that her medical bills were higher than his salary that year. And um, so it was always, it was always hard. You know, I think, he, I think in some way he resented her and she resented him and they stayed married because they were devout Mormons. And um, it's just what you did with, with uh, eight children. And so um, it made for a tough life. I mean, at one time uh, the, a, a gang of hell's angels we were like, it was a bad part of town. A, a, a gang pulled into the vacant lot next to us and there were probably 30 motorcycles and, you know, 50 members. My sister walked over to see if she could join them. Wow. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, I'd rather go with you guys. So it was, it was a tough time. It's so true. The choices we make when we were young about who we're going to marry or what we're going to do. You know, sometimes I think it's luck that people make a good decision because you, you you're so unformed you don't really know yourself all that well and you know marriages are often based upon attraction that doesn't last um and i know i hate the current divorce rate and i think it's terrible that families are shattered like that but i don't know that it was wonderful to have people live together i had grandparents who never should have been married and who lived together miserably for decades and you know it's sort of the counter argument to divorce well Marriage is, I mean, marriage is, is tough, um, period. And, but I have learned far more from that relationship. Carrie and I, um, there are times when we was like, we didn't think we were going to make it. And I am so grateful that, you know, look at it and say, okay, we're two broken people. When you come from that basis, and it's like, uh, people have this idea, it's like, well, I'm going to run off to the next real thing. And it's like, there's no real thing. Okay, it, it's like relationship, unless you're dealing with like, you know, severe abuse or nar narcissistic personality or disorder, um, marriage is hard. And um, I have to say, I, 
we are in a happy time of life. I'm so grateful that she's in my life when we're married. I'm grateful for the institution of marriage. And, um, but we had a, we had to learn a lot and, um, you know, I carried a lot of baggage and, uh, you know, taking these two very different backgrounds and bringing them together. But I'm so grateful. I mean, I, it changed who I am. It, it made me a better man. It, it taught me uh, tolerance and kindness and also what real love is. And, um, and I'm now, we're really reaping that now. Um, I, it's such a joy to wake up every morning next to her. And, you know, I don't want anyone else. I, it's like, okay, I want to spend the rest of my days with you. And our little dog uh, is part of that. He hops up in bed with us. And we're, Love the dog. If right. I kiss, start kissing her, he'll try to jump in and start trying to kiss too. It's kind of like we share her. <laughs> and um, and she, he, he's bonded to her. And it's very sweet, you know, it's like, and so on that level, life is really, really sweet. And I'm really grateful for it. And it wasn't always that way. Um, no. But I, I, had to grow, you know, I had to grow up. I, I just, I, right. neither of us really knew how to have a really good marriage. And we stuck with it. Well, that's great. I learned that um, I could make a much better decision at 49 than I made at 19. I've been married very happily for 30, 32 years in December. Um, so, you know, I'll tell you what, Richard, it's better to have a happy ending than it is, you know, an easy beginning and then it goes bad. So I feel very grateful that I've lived long enough to make that work out. And I agree that, you know, a happy marriage, a content marriage, a happy marriage is a wonderful thing, much better than living alone. Your Mr. Foster in the book has lost his wife and his child. Sorry? You're giving away too many spoilers, Barbara. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I, well, he's by himself. So don't you think that people will yeah. recognize that from the beginning? Yeah, he was, he was a, yeah, he was, he was lonely. And it's like what happened to his wife and child, you find out later, because he's separated from them and why. Um, but he's a lonely man. And especially being a black man in the state of Utah, which I, which I said was as rare as a palm tree here. Um, it's, it was very, it was very uncommon. Uh, people, people will say sometimes, why aren't there more black characters? I'll do a video. What I did a video for my Michael Vay series, and it's like we had all these kids, and someone said, someone wrote, why were all the brown kids? And I said, you have to understand, there was not one black kid in that entire school, and that's hard for someone in the East to understand, or in a larger city to understand. But there are many counties <laughs> in Utah. Um, I happen to be almost. Um, an anomaly in that sense that my best friends growing up were black um, as a in middle school and um so we, and it was an interesting lesson you know growing up with them and he's here yeah, to be barred from places to see prejudice firsthand but also they see both sides of it too because he once told me because you're prejudiced my best friend mike you're prejudiced and i said no i'm not and he goes yeah you are but i'm more prejudiced than you because black people are way more prejudiced than white people hmm. and um I, th I thought it was interesting and just and the one time his mother took me aside and showed me that um the block that her grandmother who was a slave would wash clothing on and and there was a there's very there was anger very much there was anger at her and she wanted to show it to me and so uh it was very it was interesting that i i got a very broad background my um this is not uncommon for me to write about race my second book i wrote after 45 you know i've written 45 novels my very second book was about race it was timepiece um, where and it was played by James Earl Jones in the movie. And so um, when I, you know, to me, the, the real, what they, he, you know, I learned as a little boy that it really isn't a question of, of failure of politics. It's a question of the failure of the heart. It's when you have compassion for all living beings, when you, look, when you love, when you reach out and look at each other and, and just ask a very simple question, um, you know, the golden rule to treat other people the way you want to be treated. It's, it, that really is the failure. When you can look at someone and say, it's okay for to hurt them, no matter what color you are, um, that's the real failure. I was thinking, so what we have is the young boy whose brother dies in Vietnam, whose parents' marriage is in jeopardy. They move back to Utah, which is not the Elysian field that his mother thinks it is. He's often hungry, he's lonely, he's bullied in school, and he doesn't really have enough money to do things. And, you know, it's almost Dickensian in that sense. And then, and then 
gradually he finds ways to overcome this, um, like collecting bottles. He collects bottles. <laughs> the um, and he, bottles. he figures that he's going to get really rich. And then he, he not only collects bottles, but then he thinks he can shovel snow um, and get paid for that and, you know, other things. And so he develops an entrepreneurial spirit um, Very much so. because things are not handed to him. So it's tremendously character developing and gives him a lot of tools to go through life. So basically, you know, if you're going to ascend, you have to have first gone down, right? That's kind of how gravity works. Um, I'm looking for the safe. I actually found it because this was a trip through memory lane for me as well. And yeah. so that little safe, he, he was given a safe for his birthday. And my, um, I got that safe. My parents uh -huh. gave me a safe for the birthday. And I thought that was the most magical thing. It made me feel like King Tot practically to have this little, little safe and I, I would store things in like candy bars or things that were very valuable to me. Um, and then start to store the, the money he would save. Uh, that was completely dead on. You know, that's where I was as a kid. I, um, it was like, I soon realized that I really couldn't depend on my parents to buy me things. So I paid for my own college by the time I was, you know, I paid for my own church mission. I went on a church mission. And it's like, I, I actually did financially quite well as a young man. Um, bought my own car, you know, it's just like, I was kind of by the age of 12, I was paying for everything on my own. So uh, again, that's just how, that's just how we saw it. We, we lived, it was very different in that as kids, we were very independent, very independent, spent a lot of time alone, built a clubhouse, um, kind of a come and go. I was elected junior class president. I realized the last day of school that my mother didn't know this. It's just we that's how we lived. It just it wasn't surprising to me. We just lived separate lives in a way. There are a number of writers, if you look at their autobiographies, thinking about Agatha Christie in particular, who were lonely children. And because they were lonely children, I think that they learned to not only foster their imagination, but a, a creativity and an independence that children who are maybe running around distracted all the time with other stuff never really achieved. Uh, no question. I'm grateful for every part of it. I remember um, at one time we, after we moved out of that really bad place, uh, my dad bought a lot. And we built this home ourselves and it was in, in a nice neighborhood next to a country club. And there were some really wealthy people who, who um, lived in the area. And I remember years later, um, I had started an ad agency. We we're handling the top political races in the state, uh, multi-million dollar races. I had all these employees. And one of the kids who was in a wealthy family came to see me and he came down to my office and just saw it. It's like, wow, you have a, you have a secretary and a receptionist and employees and all these people do this. How did you get this? And I said, I was doing this while you were skiing. I go everything like I, I learned how to fix a lawnmower engine. I taught myself how to fix. It. I took it apart and put it back together and it worked and I built my own go-kart mostly out of plywood. He liked it. So he told his dad, his dad bought my racing go-kart, you know, the next week. And it's like, he, and so here he was in his thirties, he was struggling trying to figure out what he was going to do with his life. And um, so I was grateful to learn that lesson at a young age is none of it was bad. It was hard. But by the time I was, you know, in my early twenties, I had figured out that anything I was going to accomplish in life, I had to do on my own. If you're handed everything, it's difficult to develop any kind of independence or entrepreneurial spirit or even any sense of direction. So I do think you were lucky. One thing you talk about in the book that made life even more complicated for, despite, you know, along with a lack of money and being lonely and all, is um, Tourette's syndrome. And I don't know how many people really even know what Tourette's is, but perhaps you could tell us a little bit about it. Well, Tourette's is a neurological disorder that's usually characterized by tics, um, and especially vocal tics. That's how, uh, if you have vocal tics, it's, they're almost positive you have Tourette's. And so uh, most people think of coprolalia, people shouting out swear words. I have those impulses. As a, as a teenager, I couldn't figure out why I'd be, I'd be in quiet places, and I just want to shout out horrible words. And I just, I mean, I thought it was demonic. It's like, oh, Satan's at me, you know, being a religious a religious kid it's like okay that's what it is it's Tourette's you know um 
And it wasn't until I was older that I was diagnosed. I've had more than 23 different ticks. And uh, well, I cry now, even as we speak, I, one of the things I do is I take sharp corners and um, it brings me comfort and, and it calms me. And um, to anyone who knows me, they talk about my corners. They can tell if I've been somewhere because I take these bills and fold them like that. And um, when I was first diagnosed, the doctor, who was literally a scientist, he said, um, do you have the desire to touch sharp objects? And I pulled seven sharp objects out of my, out of my pockets. Um, it's like, that's why I've been doing this since I was a, a boy, touching sharp things. And to the point that sometimes I'd come and I wasn't a cutter, but I would have my arm would be like shredded almost, but just like um, taking sharp things on it. It's like, sometimes it would bleed. It's like, well, I wasn't trying to, it's not the same reason. Cause I, you know, I had a child who was a cutter and it was very severe and very different thing, but it would just happen because touch again, touching sharp things makes me feel good. So that's it, one of many things with Tourette's. I wonder, does it, does it have some sort of the jolt to the nervous system? Does it, you know, maybe there must be some response in your nervous system to the, to the sharpness. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's, it, it's, Ticks are usually set off in my case with stress. And so it used to be when I was in advertising, I remember, I remember I went on vacation and we drove to Southern Utah and we're coming back. And I remember Carrie reached over and I was twitching really hard my face. And she, just, she was really sweet. She just put her hand on my face and just say, are you okay? And I would just, um, I wrote a blog about that once because a woman wrote me an anonymous letter that said, um, I was speaking in a church and she said, you're, you're an evil man, Mr. Evans, you're a sinful man and you have no, you have no place speaking in, in the church of God. And uh, she knew this because I couldn't hide my sins because I was twitching. And of course it was anonymous. So I, anyways, I posted a letter to her. I said, you know what? The sad thing is a little boy, I would believe you. You know, I thought something was wrong with me. I thought, Satan was in me because I would want to say bad words and I would um and I really struggled and I said but you know what you can't touch me now I'm way beyond you it's like I have a wonderful life my kids don't even see my ticks they just know it's a father who loves them it's like I've, I've been invited to the White House three times um millions of people have read my books it's like it's like and but I still tick and I still have Tourette's and I didn't ask for it but it's who I am. And I posted that online. I said, because this woman obviously isn't going to follow me. I said, but maybe someone will read this. So I posted it. And, um, and the reason I posted it is because I'd just been at a book signing and a kid came who's a teenager and he was ticking like crazy. Mm. And I turned to his mother and I said, and of course my Michael Vay series, Michael has Tourette syndrome. Well, that's because I have Tourette's and my son Michael has Tourette's. And so I turned to her, I said, how long um, has he been manifesting these symptoms? She goes, oh, he doesn't have Tourette's. Oh, yes, he does. He goes, we don't want to label him. And I said, oh, ma'am, that's a horrible idea. Yeah. I said, the day I, was, the day I was diagnosed was a day of freedom for me. Trust me, he knows something's wrong. Trust me, he knows every single day. Every time someone takes a picture, he's aware of it. It's like he knows every hour of the day. It's like you to pretend it doesn't exist was a horrible thing. So that's why I posted this. So I posted at midnight. The next morning I got up, I had 78,000 comments. 78,000, it went completely viral. And it just had, it had millions of views eventually that post on it. But it's, it helped me find the woman who said this. I never heard from the woman. Um, you know, I, get, I guess she's a woman. She put a fake woman's name on it. But, um, but it's just how sad, <laughs> I mean. I mean, as a little boy, I remember I was in church and I thought there was, um, I guess Mormons call him general authority. So he was a church leader and everyone just said, he's a really important man. So I assumed that he was really you know, gifted, powerful, right, spiritually. And I thought maybe if I just shake his hand, my this will go away. I didn't know his trends. I just, whatever was wrong with me, you know, would go away. And I waved it in line and I shook his hand and it didn't go away, you know, but it just shows that. And I was a little boy who thought really deeply and had tremendous faith and which also brought along a lot of uh, disappointments as well. Well, I feel fortunate that I don't have a neuro, whatever it is, disease, but I would think, I would think that knowing it's a disease and that's something else would be really comforting. 
if you have to live with it. I mean, you know, if you're ill, you're ill. Or not ill. I mean, it's yeah, not. It was it, but I wasn't diagnosed until 20 years ago. Really? Um, so I was an adult. And the reason I was diagnosed is because a doctor saw me and they, and he was working with my son who had some, um, he probably thought he had Tourette's. And it's, it's, Tourette's, of course, is uh, hereditary. And so they wanted to, um, he wanted to test me. So I basically I filled out this for 45 minutes, filled this form. He's like, wow, you just nailed it. I mean, you definitely have Tourette's every part of it, everything you answer. It's like, you are a classic Tourette, you know, someone classic Tourette syndrome. And I don't, um, I can see it. I'm good at hiding. See, we see you like this. You can't see what I'm doing right now. <laughs> uh, I, I'm good at hiding my threats. So I have friends who don't know I have threats, so they might just think I have a twitch now and then. Um, but it's just it's part of who I am. And uh, I just, it makes me, when I read, I, I actually cried at the end of my book, right? I mean, just even going through it, I had trouble getting through it. And, you know, I just looked at that little boy and he was so alone. <laughs> and I was eight years old when the threats first manifested. So, and my first, my first tick was like this. And I remember I couldn't stop shrugging and my mom yelled at me and told me to stop. And think about Tourette's, you can force yourself not to do it, but it's kind of like fortune, you know, it's like you have a niche. Eventually you're gonna to have to scratch it. It doesn't just go away. And that's, um, that's what it was like. So I felt, I mean, I felt guilt for that. And you know, I felt guilt that I was disobeying my mother, uh, but, you know, I just didn't know. She didn't know either. She meant well. She, she actually pointed to a man who was hunched over. He's bent over. had almost a hunchback. She said, if you don't stop, you're going to look like that. I was like, great. I'm going to be a nine. I'm going to be eight year old hunchback. And, and I guess in her own way, she, she meant well, but it, it definitely was not another thing to lay on a little kid who was struggling with so much. Oh, it's, I'm sorry that it was a delayed diagnosis. It might've been helpful to you if you'd known earlier. It would have. Absolutely would have. So despite all the things we're talking about, this is a very joyful book and it has a wonderful Christmas spirit at the end. Don't forget the dog. Um, puppies make your life more a warm. There's almost nothing better than having a warm puppy in your lap. You know, it is so incredibly comforting. And when he comes back, our little, we have twin puppies. They're from the same litter and an older dog. And when the little guy comes back from because he's he's all puffy he's a cavapoo when he comes back from the groomer he smells wonderful and he's like a big powder Bo, puff. Bo's a cavapoo you have a cavapoo oh, yes two of them and they're oh my just, gosh they're the most wonderful dogs in the world they absolutely are I, you know it's oh just I, there he is and he just he just smells so wonderful and he's so fluffy and cuddly okay. and warm and he has this long pink tongue and he has this adorable pink mouth and you know it's just and when they get up on the back of the sofa where they we allow them and they go like this with their little faces you know you just you just melt so i'll tell you one thing well and, and this before i bring patrick up you will you will maybe love this the group the breeder um when we saw the photo of the little guy in the paper and we'd fallen in love with cavapoos earlier and thought we would like to have one. There you are, right? <laughs> I can show you mine too. But anyway, she <laughs> arrived at the house and she had not just Scooter, not just the little boy, but she had this little black girl dog with her as well, Scooter's litter mate. And I knew she was doing it to us. I absolutely knew it that, you know, and she said, well, this is the last of the litter. You know, she's going to be all alone. All alone. Oh, great. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I could see it coming. So, um, so anyway, we agreed. My husband made another trip to the bank for cash, you know, and here we are. And as she's leaving the house, she she looked at me and she said, I'm I'm so glad she said that you've taken the two puppies. She said earlier, not with these two, I think, but now that she she'd gone to Sun City with two of her dogs, which is their retirement area here in Arizona. And, and the people were very nice, and, but she thought they were too old to adopt puppies. And I said to her, I knew I was gonna be fighting my worst self. I said to her, how old were they when you felt that you couldn't leave the puppies with them? And she said, they were 70. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I should let this go. I really should let this go, but I just couldn't. And I said, how old do you think I am? And, you know, she kind of looked at me and I said, well, actually, I'm 81. 
and as she sort of, but I said, we've already made arrangements for the puppies and a serious trust fund to go to a friend in case anything happens to us. Cause you do, you know what, Richard, you do have to be a responsible dog owner, right? And at our age, if you take on puppies, which in our case will be the last one, you can't just be casual about it. Oh, the other, the, the thing is, that, again, it comes down to, um, to this love. It's just, this dog brings so much joy. He jumps in our bed. I let him out of the kennel at 6 30 in the morning. He jumps on our bed, licks Carrie's face for a few minutes and then snuggles up between us. And um, it's such a joyful thing. I forgot how fun and how wonderful. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Looks like. And puppy. Like, oh. <laughs> he okay. shredded up a napkin. Um, and, my, and my wife, Carrie, who it's her dog. Um, oh, yeah. and they bond because they're half poodle, which are very, very smart and bonded to her. And um, she never wanted a dog. In fact, that was almost a deal breaker before I got married because I had three dogs. And she's like, oh. I can't, I don't want a dog. And um, she didn't like dogs. And boy, has he ever changed? <laughs> First of all, he's changed. His dog is, it's, it's, it's one, one day her, she goes, I love you. And I turn back, I love you too. And it's like, oh, you were talking to Bo. <laughs> you were talking to the dog. She goes, well, I love you too. It's like, I know. I like <laughs> well, me. dogs can do that to you for sure. <laughs> so Patrick, you want to come up with your fellow dog lover? Come back and talk to us. Because mm. Patrick has had experiences with his own dogs and also caring for other people's dogs. Yeah, and cats. Probably more cats than dogs now, but um, definitely I've had dogs. Greyhounds, you know, which are beautiful beasts. Um, let's see here. We have some questions from the audience. Actually, but first, Richard, I wanted to ask you, have, have you by chance um, come across the novel by Jonathan Lethem called Motherless Brooklyn? Um, I've heard of it, but no. Yeah, well, no. His the only reason I bring it up is that his protagonist has Tourette's, and he's a uh, he's. Oh yes, I have. Yeah, Carrie read it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and a lot of people, myself included, when I read it, I had you know misunderstood really what what the illness was all about, and the character in the book, his tics manifest in really interesting ways. You know, a lot of them are word association tics. You know, he'll think of a word and it'll like roll into another word and another word. Very interesting. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that it can do is that I don't know if you know this, like Rich Little, the impersonator, yeah, and most impersonators have Tourette syndrome. Um, I can. It's actually I realized that I was watching my son watch TV and he was like mimicking what they're saying and repeating, and, and um, that I actually can do that with writing. That I can take someone's book and I can read two pages and I can write in their style. Wow, that's so I have to be careful about what I'm reading when I'm writing it because I was reading the Lord <laughs> of the Rings trilogy when I was writing my book Carousel, and all of a sudden, it's, I started to start pulling in Tolkien's grammar and structure, and it's like, oh no, 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 this has got to stop. So you've got you have Gollum the dog, right? I know, yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry, what were you going to say, Barbara? I was just thinking, you know, that so it can enhance mimicry. Is what it is that mm -hmm. really what it does? Yes. How fascinating. It is fascinating. It's a very, a very, it's a neurological, it's very interesting the way it manifests. So it just shows that brains are wired differently. Mm -hmm. Endlessly complicated. Indeed. Let's see. Okay, so there's some good questions here. Um, oh, our, our good Italian friend, Stefania, who should be receiving a package from us very shortly. She says, I love Christmas. It's really the most wonderful time of the year. Um, I would like to know what Mr. Evans's personal meaning is um, for this special celebration and what he would like readers to dwell on after reading your book. Well, I, I mean, I'm a Christian. Um, when the New York Times called me the king of Christmas fiction, so they kind of coronated me. Um, Jonathan Carp, the president of Simon Schuster Global, he wrote, he just said, but it's the king of Christmas. And boy, did I get a lot of letters from people saying Jesus is the king of Christmas, like I was blas blaspheming him. It's like, yeah, I believe that too. Um, I Christmas was this time of magic, and that's the only way I can describe it. It was magic. It was this beautiful time, which is why the Mrs. Covey thing was so difficult. Um, the end of the book, if you read the epilogue, it, get, it tells you exactly what I hope you bring. And I've had people tell me they're, you know, they're quoting it everywhere, the way the book ends. But the idea that there's there's these Christmases in our lives that um, that stay with us and they give us hope, and in this book it's like it talks a lot about grief and loss, and that 
in the end, that love wins. And that really is what I want people to take away, that love wins. And so, and so I don't shy away. It is listed. It's the, like the number one Christian audio book in America right now on Audible. And, um, you know, it's a Christmas book. So, of course, it's a Christian book to that level. But I think anyone could enjoy it. And, and they do, actually. I mean, I have fans all over the world, so including Iran. I have a fan club in Iran, if you can believe that, in Tehran. Nice. Um, okay, here's another question. Do you believe in fate? Do you think we're meant to meet certain people in our lives? It's a good question. Um, I, th I, I actually do believe so. I do believe that. Um, just from a few experiences I've had. I, 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 see, I see people go a little too far in that. I think we get a lot of people we may or may not supposed to be meet. But I believe that this life is um, it's an ex it's, it's designed as a kind of the perfect um, holodeck. And that if you're a Star, you know, Star Trek fans, and that we do have experiences that help us grow. And we're here to grow and experience. Let's see. Uh, uh, Jell, I think is the way her name is pronounced. J-E-L. Might not even be a she. I'm sorry, Jell. Um, uh, from Australia. She tunes in all the time and we really appreciate, appreciate it. She says, I like the way dogs manage to bring people that don't like dogs uh, around to liking them. That's so true. <laughs> That's funny. Last last night we decided to bring our dog over to the um the senior center where my grand where my um mother-in-law is. And we brought Bo because it brings them joy. They're so happy. And they were they were dining the dining room's downstairs and they all wanted to see Bo. We took him around. There was so, all the smiles, the whole table smile. Well, this one man just crushed you, just looking death at me. And then he shouts at me, dogs don't belong in the dining room. And I said, you're absolutely right, sir. And I just, I just stayed there. Is that what he's going to do? It's like he's cleaner than you are. At least he smells better. And it's, it's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage this old man. And uh, but I thought how funny it's like, and I just, I mean, I actually felt bad for the old guy because like he's obviously miserable. But just watching how how many smiles, how people were like just delighted that Bo was there. How could you how could you not? <laughs> yeah, animals really do bring people together. I mean, you see it all the time. And we've had a couple, haven't we, Barbara? Some some dogs in the bookstore just recently too that have have kind of yeah, they, they steal the show a little bit. <laughs> our most loyal customer currently, or most loyal attendee is a yeah. Uh, Havanese and her name is Kyrie and she has lots of hair and her owner gives her a top knot with a barrette. She's super adorable. She's and got she fluff in front of her I, eyes. I so have a always... wonderful photo of her with Jeffrey Deaver. Um, I'll see if I can show it to you because Jeffrey is just like blown away with this little little dog. She is so sweet. I don't know if you could really see it or not, but here's Jeffrey and here's this little girl yes, down there. Yeah. Yep. And, and she has you know, fur in front of her face, so she's always she to look at you. She's always giving you side eye, which is really cute. It is. And so far, so far, nobody has objected to her being in the store. She's well, that's true. Reach. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's always the crusty old, there's always the potential for a customer to, you know. Some people are terrified of dogs. So far. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see here. Anything else? Um you know, Richard, just a lot of people that love your books and are and are making very nice comments. Um, you know, the, the, the movie I'm getting flooded. We had last week, and it's only out four days, we had 37 million viewers worldwide of The Noel Diary. And it was, if you looked, it was for eight days, it was the number one movie in, um, in America on Netflix. Um, and I am hearing from like everyone, you realize how ubiquitous it is. I'm hearing from old high school and junior high school friends and um it's fun to watch so if you haven't seen the noel diary yet on netflix uh, it's it's really good they, they did uh, charles shire who is a director of he's an acclaimed director he did father of the bride and then of course justin hartley from this is us and a new fairly new actress barrett doss the chemistry is wonderful and the new york times called it the best christmas movie of the season um, and Los Angeles Times said it was that was it was the movie to see when they were at Roundup, and so um, people love it. And 
it's fun. It's fun just seeing that much power. And, and I'm getting flooded with people joining my Facebook and mailing list, social media, just flooding in um, like levels I've never seen. Um, and it's just the power of that. People are like, who is this Richard Paul Evans guy? And, and the thing is like, people say, oh, he writes schmaltzy stuff. It's like, people who say I've never read my books. It's like, mm, I think you need to read. They just assume they, that they I'm writing. And the funny thing is like, like the New York Times says, like, this is not a light topic. The way it's written, it's actually pretty heavy and fairly, you know, deep. And um, so anyway, it's a fun time. It's a fun time to have. Um, Jonathan Karp wrote me. He's the president of Simon Schuster Global. And he said, um, he goes, you have the number one movie in America and a number five book, hardcover book in America. Um, I'm glad to see that the king of Christmas is still reigning <laughs> after all these years. And uh, that was my favorite comment of the, of the season so far. Does that ever become overwhelming to you? Do you, are you, are you mainly an introverted character or extrovert or can you, can you pass as an extrovert when you want to, but you're really an introvert? <laughs> I'm, I'm kind, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of both actually, because I'm actually more comfortable in, a, you know, speaking to a crowd of 10,000 people, people are like terrified. It doesn't scare me at all. I, 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 it, it fires me up. makes me feel good. Um, and yet in a small group, I'd rather just be alone. I'm, I'm the guy who kind of slips off and uh, spend a lot of time alone like I did as a kid. So um, this has been an interesting season. People said you must be slammed. And I said, well, yes and no. Um, it's been super highs and just kind of in nothing. So um, one of our dreams that I always, uh, you know, I dreamed of is like, what it would be like to be on those red carpet Hollywood walkthroughs, you know, with the stars and everything you see. And, and um, Carrie and I actually got to do that this year. And it was, it exceeded my dream. I usually yeah. reality doesn't, it was so beautiful. I remember I came back to our hotel. We were in the Palisades, you know, Charles Shire, Justin Hartley and all these like the former president of MGM. It's like, it was huge. And, and I go back, Carrie goes, you're not, you're not going to be able to sleep tonight. Are you? I said, no way. I go, this is kind of, this is high. It's just kind of awesome. And, but then I come back and today I just kind of sat around all day and played with the dog. I fixed the Christmas lights. And, uh, just, yeah, so it's kind of, and I used to be like being on book tour, which is incredibly lonely, by the way. So I remember when, when Janet Joplin said, I make love to 10,000 people and then go home alone. Uh, I remember just, I mean, for, I can't tell you how many years I would just sit in a hotel room alone on the, on the weekends. I'd just be so lonely. Um, go down to the gym and work out and just eat dinner alone. It's just like, it was, so such a weird thing. And then I mentioned this and I realized I can't talk about this because I was at a book sign. I mentioned, I said, it's, they said, what is the book tour like? And I said, well, it's exciting and it's very lonely. And um, I got eight offers to come back to my hotel room. And it's like, okay, I can't, there's just like slipping papers. Like, okay, we can't do this anymore. I'm married <laughs> and believe in the sanctity of that. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, well some of the questions that have come in there, there are always a few of them asking about Michael Vay. Any plans to bring him back? I did bring him back. Okay. So Michael Vay is back and at number eight. It, it debuted at number five on the New York Times series. Um, Michael Vay is a global phenomenon. It sold three and a half million copies. I have fans. The biggest countries outside of the U.S. are, Fr are um, France, um, Korea, Taiwan, um, Anyway, I just, like I said, I'm, I'm getting all these letters from Tehran and I asked my agent, I said, I didn't know we sold this to Tehran. She goes, we didn't, we don't have trade laws. So they just stole it. So I got a letter uh, two days ago from a little boy in the middle of Iran and with everything that's going on. He goes, I have no way of getting book number eight. Is there any way you can tell me how I can get the new book? I'm your biggest fan. I thought how beautiful that, um, that a series like this can bring people together. I did a Skype in Saudi Arabia and it was voted their, their favorite book series in their school. And here are the kids that come up and say, hi, this is my name. They all spoke very good English. Um, I'm from Jordan. I'm from Pakistan. I'm from um, Syria. It was, it was remarkable, actually. So um, Michael Vay is back. The new, the new book is called The Parasite. It came out a month before my Christmas book. Um, it's a bestseller. And uh, if, you, if you have a maniac in your life, you definitely want to pick those up. Excellent. Well, somebody was asking us to hold up a copy of the book, which I'll be very delighted to do. There we go. Here's what we're all doing that. Here we go. 
Yeah. There we are. All They're beautiful, aren't they? So I, when I saw the design, I gasped. They're gorgeous little books. And so my first book, The Christmas Box, people bought it because they just liked the package. Yeah. And then and then they would they just buy it. They didn't, didn't even read it. And then they would give them out. And the people would say, that book was so meaningful. And I cried. And, and then they would call me and try to get it. The book was sold out. It was completely sold out nationwide. And um, you know, it, it kept hitting the bestseller list for three years. We would just bring it out again at Christmas and come out again. So this book is absolutely gorgeous. It makes you a great gift. And like we talked about, Barbara, I, I talked to the publisher and actually lowering the price so that people could buy multiple copies. And so yeah. I'm signing books. Up. Someone's coming down to my office. We sold, they bought 40 copies of it. And that's not, I, we're very rare to go to book signing. People buy just one. That's wonderful. Wonderful story, wonderful package, excellent gift opportunity. And what a pleasure it has been to spend an hour with Richard again. We've been fortunate to do that for several years. That's always a tremendous treat. I will now think of you always, though, as under the screen with a sharp object. <laughs> there you are, indeed. So happy holidays to all of you. Merry Christmas. And thank you, Richard, for spending some time oh, with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And give all my, uh, I know their fans are coming from all over and even Australia. Hi. Down under, but um, we just we always moved to Arizona once. My wife went to Mesa High, so Arizona is near and dear. And uh, I can't wait to get to come back there. And well, we would love to have you. And you know what? I can bring Cavapoos to the book signing. I would love that. You would love that. Yeah. They're yeah. really fun, and I'm so glad that you have one because they are truly, they are just Christmas spirit dogs. I think for sure. And I love Bo. If you come away from this book with no one else that your heart has gone out to, it will definitely be for Bo. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it really will. Bye.